Hey everyone, welcome to the Language of Coaching webinar. My name is Nick Winkleman. Now, the webinar you're about to go through is based on my forthcoming book, The Language of Coaching, which comes out at the end of next month, April 2020. But I wanted to get the key concepts of the book out sooner in the form of this free webinar, notably with the situation going on with COVID-19. I know we have a lot of people at home looking for ways to get better. So I want to do my part in sharing some key insights that I've developed over 15 years in strength and conditioning. So even though I can't give everything that comes into the book, I think over the next two hours, you are going to learn the key core takeaways that can help you become a better coach so that when you get out of this situation and when your athletes get out of this situation we are in, we are all better for it. I hope you enjoy the next two hours. See you on the other side. So what do I mean by the language of coaching? I think to explain that, it's useful to give you a little bit of indication into my background and my story. So I've been a strength conditioning coach now for over 15 years. And like many individuals, I started out getting an exercise and sports science degree and going through various jobs. One of those was as a personal trainer. And I'll be the first to say that no matter what element or what section of the movement profession you're going to go into, starting out as a personal trainer is a great decision. One, it allows you to develop the foundations of program design and coaching, but also you get to learn how to communicate with many different types of people. And that is so valuable in all elements of the movement profession. So, Taking that on board, more by chance than choice, I found myself learning to become a personal trainer. And in doing so, I went through this in-house certification course that was being offered at my university. So I went through it and I inevitably got certified and afterwards, I started shadowing other personal trainers alongside doing my own coaching, trying to get better. And I met one specific individual named JC. And Something about this coach, about this trainer, stuck out in my mind. And it wasn't so much what he did, in that his exercises, his reps, his sets, weren't that much different to anyone else, and frankly reflected many of the books I was reading at the time. But what was different was how he coached, the way he communicated, the way he gave feedback, and notably, this precise use of cues. He would always give individuals very specific things to think about before they moved. And I noticed that it wasn't always the exact same cue. He would engage in a discussion. He'd try out a cue. If it did not work, he'd refresh it. And oftentimes the cue would come from the client themselves if he couldn't come up with one on his own. So it seemed, and, and while I couldn't reflect on this level of detail at the time, it seemed that for whatever reason, he focused on what the client focused on while they moved. And very often that came in the form of giving them a cue. Now, as coaches, as therapists, as trainers, we all use cues all the time. But never in my own experience as an athlete or in observing other coaches had I seen someone do it with such precision. And so powerful was this experience that I went to another mentor at the time and still is today, Dito Van Rysigam, and said, listen, one day I need to write a book called The Form Within because what is going on here is so profound, so important, yet I've never read anything about it. I've never learned it anywhere else outside observing this person train. Now, I parked that idea at the time, which was only my second year in university, and, as I should have, focused on still developing the skills around what I like to call the what. The periodization, the drills, the exercise, the screens, the assessments, so on and so forth. But that idea of the form within, of cueing being important, came back to me very quickly when I took over the NFL Combine Development Program at Exos in 2009. Now, when I took this program over, one, I took the program over from a group of individuals from a strength and conditioning perspective who were, in my opinion, SNC elite, SNC royalty. All of them inevitably went on to coach within the NFL from a strength and conditioning perspective. So when I took this program over, the physical programming itself was locked in. 
And my goal in that first year was simply to not screw it up. So I coached the heck out of it. I dotted the I's, crossed the T's, sweat the details, and made sure that the athletes did as well. So when we got through that eight-week developmental period, flew to Indianapolis where the NFL Combine is being held, I felt I had done everything I can. Now, I sit down over the four-day experience of athletes running, that is the 40-yard dash, and I had one computer with the video of, of my testing, and I had another computer with all of our results, and I was watching our players run in real time. And as I watched them run, something dawned on me. First and foremost, many of them had run faster when they were with us in Phoenix than they did in Indianapolis. That is, when we pre-test and post-tested them in Phoenix, that post-test for most of them was faster than what I was seeing happen in Indianapolis, despite having given them a taper and a recovery period. Now, don't get me wrong, they were still running far quicker than when they had come into the program, but not as fast as I knew they could. So as I got through the four days of observing them, I reflected and asked the question, why? What happened between the time they left Phoenix and landed in Indianapolis? Where had those performance results gone? And as I started to dig into the video, for me, it became clear. And that wasn't so much in, if I can draw down the analogy, the car not being optimized, but rather the driver. What I mean by that is technique. Many of the technical changes I thought we had made seemingly dissolved. Those who had been able to drive off the line from the start position, get into a long, straight body, rather than being flexed, hunched over, and falling over, had reverted back. Now those same athletes were falling out of their start. One of them almost tripped. Other athletes, well, we had taught to drive down and through the ground, or back to reaching forward and pulling. So many of the technical changes that I had assumed were there to stay had not stuck. They weren't there. They had disappeared. And as I reflected and got back to Phoenix, Arizona, I realized something. That if you physically perform any activity, sprinting, weightlifting, whatever it might be, long enough, your body will physically change. Your engine, your car will improve, independent of your ability to drive it. And that's exactly what I saw in Indianapolis. The car had been upgraded. They were able to run faster. But when I reflected on how I improved them as drivers, movement quality, coordination, the wheels had seemingly fallen off. And it hit me. The reason the wheels had fallen off, the reason they weren't able to hold on to those technical changes, had to do with me. And that is the vast majority of the technical information that they were using to improve their coordination was coming from me, my words, my language. And as I look back over that period, my mind jumped back to that coach JC when I was in college and realized that I was coaching too much, saying too much, giving three or four cues, expecting them to somehow focus on all of them in a movement that takes fractions of a second. I was giving cues, but not looking for any feedback from them. I wasn't asking questions. I wasn't looking at their eye contact, their body language. I had no idea what was getting in and what wasn't. So take that on top of giving too much information. And I realized that when I was with them, we were able to assemble this optimal technique because I was the form of memory. I was the audio loop reminding them again and again and again. But because of the way I coached, it didn't allow them to own the change. And thus, when they got under pressure, when they went to the NFL Combine, they reverted back to the technical way that they had come in. And in that moment, I realized, even though there might be more to that story than just how I coached, I knew that how I coached had a lot to do with it. And thus, that sent me on a mission from 2009 to where I sit here today in 2020, to study this in my own practice, to read everything I can on motor learning and skill acquisition, and specifically the impact of language on attention, on focus, on learning, 
to the extent that I went and got a PhD, not because I want to be a professor, but I want to learn how to ask and answer questions. And specifically, I wanted to learn how to ask and answer questions related to how we coach and coaching language. And what I'm able to present today and what will be released in my book later next month is a synopsis, a synthesis of all that learning. Academically supported, but born out of work in the trenches. Because at the end of the day, don't call me doctor, call me coach. And that's what this webinar is all about. Now, a quick bit of housekeeping. I want to first and foremost thank you for joining the Language of Coaching website. For those of you that have, you are now having the slides of this presentation and are the first to view this webinar. If you are viewing this webinar at a later date, you can still go to thelanguageofcoaching.com and get the slides, as well as many other pieces of content that I'll be releasing now in and around the book, but also moving forward, including my Language of Coaching course to be released in the coming months. If you have not yet, I encourage you to go out and pre-order your copy of The Language of Coaching. And obviously, if the book is already released, please feel free to do so because it echoes everything we're going over in this webinar. And while in 60 minutes, I believe I can give you the high-level insights of the book, the detail and the behavior change of upgrading your coaching will only come through deep study and application. And the book is there to guide you every step of the way. To begin, we want to look at this concept of the coaching communication loop. And in the book, I talk about this in chapter four. And that is when we think about communication in a coaching context, well, we talk all the time. We talk before a session, we talk throughout a session, as well as after one. And this doesn't matter if you're a sport coach, strength coach, or physical therapist. So if we're gonna talk about this idea of the language of coaching, we need to know categorically where certain types of communication need to live. So to explain this, I want you to imagine you're coming on the back of an off-season, working with a group of players for the first time that year. Some of them might be returning, some of them might be brand new. Let's say you're a physical therapist, you're working with a patient for the very first time, going through some movement skills. Or you're a sport coach, working with a youth team, and it's the first time you've worked with them, equally a parent, trying to teach their child how to ride a bike for the first time. If we take all of these scenarios, typically the first category of communication once introductions are done around movement is going to be what we call a description and that is you're describing the movement they're about to go through so from an s c perspective let's think of a squat i'm teaching someone a squat for the first time i talk about how to get under the bar how to step back into the rack how to set the feet how to squat down how to stand back up equally once i've given that description or even possibly before i'll do some type of a demonstration now, this could be me doing the demonstration. It could be another athlete performing the demonstration, or equally, I could use video. But either way, I give some kind of visual prompt to sit next to my verbal prompt. Now, collectively, if we consider all of this information, it's quite a bit. So normally, what we will do is give some kind of a brief cue, or what I might say is a brief phrase used to bring focus to the activity. And when we are giving someone a cue, we're operating on the principle that they are going to focus on that while they perform the activity. With the idea being, if they focus on this cue, somehow it will make that movement better. And so inherently, since we know that they can't focus on everything we talked about and demonstrated, the cue is that singular brief phrase to bring a summary focus to help them with the activity. Now, when I talk about cueing, Oftentimes, it will come from the standpoint of coach to athlete. But let me say it now, and I will say it again. Cueing, or at least the best cueing, as we'll come to understand, is born out of conversation. And that is, the cue can come from the athlete. A coach can facilitate it in saying, hey, we're looking at this movement. Let's say it's a squat. It appears that we can be sitting back a little bit more in the squat. What do you think you need to focus on? So bringing the athlete or the client into the conversation to come up with the cue, perfectly fine. So case in point, in summary, it doesn't matter who comes up with the cue as long as there's this idea, this last focus point that's brought into the movement, so to speak, to make it better. 
So once we synthesize that cue, then the athlete is going to perform the movement. And we as the coach should be observing, trying to get a sense of whether or not that cue made a difference, whether or not that drill that we provided made a difference. And then whether it's done immediately after, in a delay form or in a summary form after a number of sets, you will typically go through some kind of a debrief. You will go through a feedback session. And this is player and coach feedback. And thus, even though, again, we typically think of feedback as a one-way street coach to athlete, the best type of feedback, as we'll talk about, is in conversation. So that means asking questions, inviting the athlete into the conversation. How did this feel? Possibly showing them a video. What are you seeing here? So we can get their subjective experience to sit along the objective one that we viewed. Now, collectively, I call this the long coaching loop. The short coaching loop, as you may have guessed, only involves three of these ingredients, and that is the cue, the do, and the debrief. Why? Very simply, once you've taught someone for the first time, you've given them that long description, you've taken them through that demonstration, it is not necessary to continue to describe and demonstrate unless you feel you need to give them a refresher, you're coming off that off season, or possibly they ask. So the long loop involves all five categories, but the short loop, the one you use all the time with your athletes or your clients moving forward is the cue, the do, and the debrief. It doesn't matter how long they've been performing the movement, we always need to come up and identify something to focus on, even if it's generated in the athlete's head without our reminder. So there's always some kind of thinking, that's the cue. There's always doing, there's the movement, and there's always some kind of a debrief. Even if it's silent reflection with the athlete and with you, the debrief is happening. But oftentimes we come together to synthesize the next best cue, the next best focus point, so they can perform the next repetition better. So as we can see here, this provides a structure, a loop that circulates around all the movements you teach. And as a starting point, it is very beneficial to understand the different types of language that go in each of these categories. Now, in the book, The Language of Coaching, I go through that in a fair bit of practical detail. But the shining star of the book and the shining star of this presentation is going to be this idea of the cue. So we are gonna focus on the cue now for the next hour or so. And why do I bring that up? Well, simple. The kind of language we use in the cue is going to be different than the kind of language we use in describing a movement and possibly different than the kind of language we use in debriefing it. Now, they all live in the same neighborhood, right? They are next door neighbors, they are friends, but ultimately the kind of information we give to an athlete to think about while they move categorically needs to fall in a specific bandwidth. That is to say, there's specific types of cues that benefit the way people move. And equally, there are certain types of cues that constrain or possibly negatively impact the way someone moves. But here's the good thing. The type of language that I'm going to encourage you to drain out of your cues will have a home. We'll have a house in our neighborhood, and those homes are going to either be in the describe it section or the debrief it section of your communication loop. Now, while that's not totally clear right now, I'm just setting the stage that by the end of this presentation, if you think of your language as living in a locker, we will take your language locker and show you not only how to expand it, but also organize it better. So ultimately, the way we use language optimizes the way our athletes focus when they're performing and learning to move. So the cue, if you would, is going to be the centerpiece, the all-star of everything else we're gonna talk about from this moment forward. To talk about language, though, and to talk about cueing, we must first dive into this idea around attention. At the end of the day, we only learn from the things we pay attention to. Now, just to illustrate this, I want you to think of someone, possibly yourself, who has been on many, many, many flights 
Now, speaking personally, I have been on hundreds, if not approaching over a thousand flights in my life. So every single time I've gotten on one of those flights, there's been a very consistent experience. I had to first hear a safety briefing. And when I heard that safety briefing, especially now they ask you to take off your headphones and pay attention, especially here in Europe. So arguably I've heard this thing a thousand times, easily. Now, when I ask a similar question to an audience, someone inevitably stands up who has taken 500 plus flights and I will ask them the following question, which I could just as easily challenge myself to do. And that is recite the safety briefing verbatim to your flight. And at the end of the day, it gets a big applause and a laugh, but silence from the person because they can't do it. And so ultimately, what does this demonstrate? Well, it demonstrates that proximity, being around something, hearing the safety briefing, is not enough to learn it. It's only the things we pay attention to that we consciously invest our attention in that we learn from. Even in your own experience, you've probably had those athletes that pay attention, they're focused, they're switched on, versus the ones that are not. And even though they're both in the exact same session, I would argue the person that's more invested in the process gets more from it. And that's why it's a cliche, because it is true. You only get out of something what you put into it. So why is that important? Well, I'm going to be talking about cueing. I'm going to be talking about language, but that only matters to the degree that your client, your athlete, and your patient hears you and pays attention to you and ideally is invested in the process themselves. Proximity is not a surrogate for learning. You have to pay attention. So within this idea, we can only learn from the experiences we pay attention to. The coach then has a chief responsibility. And that chief responsibility is to, number one, capture attention. Number two, keep attention long enough. And then number three, direct it at the right things or facilitate it being directed at the right things through conversing with the athlete. Now, we could probably give an entire presentation on how to capture and keep motivation. But let me just give you a couple different hints here to help get the mind spinning. One way to capture attention is the name game, using someone's name. Biologically, that name is critical to our survival. It's the only way that I can stop my son right before he runs into the road or right before he puts his hand on a hot stove. That name gives me the fraction of a second where I grab his attention, he turns his head, and I can catch him before something dangerous happens. And this is embedded in the idea of the cocktail party effect, that even if you're in a cocktail party, it's very loud. If you hear your name mentioned somewhere else, your attention will be shifted. So ultimately using people's name. The other way to capture attention is simply variety. Think of a warm-up. If you always do a warm-up the exact same way, it's like listening to the same song over and over again or driving home the same way over and over again. Inevitably, you switch off. And especially for those of us that have kids, saying the same thing to our kids over and over again, we know this all too well. So variation or novelty is a great way to capture attention. The, minds get, the mind gets captured anytime we're faced with something either really, really important or subtly different, stands out, it's odd. So if you normally have a warm-up in a straight line, but today you do it in a circle, or you ask your athletes questions randomly throughout a session around how they're feeling, what they were up to, automatically people are gonna be a bit more invested. And hopefully they're having a bit more fun in the process. So when it comes to coaching, think about how can I capture attention? Now, how do I keep it? Keeping attention is a pretty simple concept, but hard to do in application. And that is people only pay attention to things that they truly value. So while I can use novelty with a whistle or maybe having a straight line turn into a circle or asking a question or using someone's name, to keep their attention is gonna take something with a little bit more substance. It's kind of like the difference between having a candy bar for breakfast versus oatmeal. 
Both of them are initially going to give me some energy, but one's going to last a lot longer. So when it comes to keeping attention, it's simple. Put the why in the what. Explain to them through one form or fashion or communicate in such a way where they value what you're talking about. So for example, if I'm in the weight room and I'm working with a bunch of rugby players, which is now the sport that I work in, and let's say we're working on the back squat for the millionth time. At the end of the day, they're not power lifters, they're rugby players, and that's where they get the value. That's why they're in the weight room. And sure, some of them love to lift weights. At the end of the day, they don't all love it, and they don't have to. So my job is to make the connection between the body positions I'm asking them to get into and the squat and the sport they're trying to perform. So in this case, if we take forwards who have to get into kind of that tightly packed scrum, the body positions are very similar. So I can draw the comparison between the squat and the scrum. And I can even tell that athlete to load down and into that squat just like they're loading and preparing to be tense as they're going into the scrum and driving up through the bar with the same kind of intensity as they drive forward in the scrum. So right there, I just coded my cue, for example, with the why that's valuable to them, ultimately turning that back squat into the scrummaging position. So that's an example that hopefully can trigger many more in your own mind on how we capture and keep. Now the final piece is where we direct attention. You know, should we be thinking about the activation of a muscle? Should we be thinking about the movement of a joint? Should we be thinking about the outcome, driving through the bar, driving through the floor? Should we have a visual in our mind, actually imagining our body in that scrummaging as we're squatting itself? Or should we not think at all? Should it just be motivational fluff, thinking about going as hard as we can? What should we actually focus on? And that's what the remainder of this presentation is about. So, in summary then, attention is the currency of learning. That's not wordplay, I mean that literally. And thus we have to be mindful of where we invest it. In summary then, for this first short section, number one, attention is a limited capacity resource. You know this. You can only focus on so many things at the same time. I think a clever way to think about this yourself, but also a fun way to explain it to others, assuming they know who Einstein is, is as follows. There is a story that Einstein, like most would, when he went to learn how to golf, he got a golf pro to teach him. And so they're out on the range, so it were said, and the golf pro is working and talks about Einstein's stance and then his grip, and then his backswing, and then his downswing, and then his contact with the ball. And inevitably, so many cues were being thrown at Einstein. Einstein paused him, went over to the back, grabbed as many golf balls as he could, and said, okay, to the golf pro, catch. And he threw them all at the golf pro. Now, of course, the golf pro is trying to catch any he could, but looking like a fool, and that was the point. Einstein says to him, you trying to catch all those balls is like me trying to focus on everything you've just said at the same time. Give me one focus point and let me own it. And I love that because at the end of the day, if you take one thing from this presentation, think about your cues and only provide one at a time because asking people to focus on two things or three things in any given instant is quite literally setting them up for failure. So just as we build a Lego, one brick at a time, let's build learning one cue at a time. Watch the echo of the cue in the movement, and then from there, if you like it, reinforce it. If you don't like it and you're sure it's not making a difference, refresh it, update it, possibly even involve the athlete in coming up with a new one. But at the end of the day, keep it to one. Second thing, we only pay attention to one thing at a time, reinforcing that point. And then finally, Coaches, like bankers, guide their athletes' attentional investments. So we capture it, we keep it, but then we need to know how to place it on the right thing at the right time. And that's what the remainder of the presentation will focus on. So in summary, we have our coaching communication loop. The long loop is the five components. The short loop, cue, do, and debrief, that's our teaching components for ongoing movement. Either way, when we talk about giving a cue, we want it to be one cue and making sure we've done everything we can to have the athlete or client or patient 
pay attention to it. So at this point in the presentation, I would encourage you to pause it and simply reflect on what you've learned so far. Thinking through the stories I've shared, the coaching communication loop, and even some of the limitations of attention and how we utilize it. And make sure you're happy and you synthesized it, putting it into your own words. Once you're happy, we can move on. So, moving on then. Now that we've talked about attention, and we've talked about how much you can focus on, we should now take a look at what you should focus on, and thus what as coaches we should say to encourage that focus. When we look at the possible things that we can say from a coaching perspective, I want you to think of them as living on a continuum that are anchored by these two ideas of an internal focus and an external focus. So like a zoom lens on a camera, our focus can go right on into the body, let's say at the muscle or the joint, and zoom right on out to focus on the goal or the outcome that I'm trying to achieve. Let's start with defining the zoomed in view, i.e. an internal focus, which sometimes we call a body focus. So this is where we encourage the athlete or the client to focus on their body, so muscles, joints, or limbs, and the associated movement process. So cues here would include flex your hips, extend your hips, dorsiflex your ankle, drive off your big toe, keep your stomach tight, keep your spine straight, chest up, shoulder blades back, extend your elbow, rotate your wrist, tuck your chin, and so on and so forth. It is the language of biomechanics. It's the language of anatomy. So any reference to a muscle activating or a joint slash limb moving by definition is an internal focus. And so if you reflect categorically on your cues, I would guarantee that you use language like this in some form or fashion across your description, your cue, and your debrief. The question we're gonna ask ourselves is how important is it to use internal language when we are cueing? Equally, if we slide to the other side of our continuum, we then get into what we call an external focus. So an external focus is now that camera lens is zoomed out. So here we're now encouraging a focus on the skill outcome, jump high, run fast, go here, go there, touch this, get away from that. Or the effect of the movement on the physical environment itself. So during a bench press, I could say the goal is to drive the bar off of you. Equally, I could say, focus on driving the bar through the ceiling. Drive the bar away from the bench. At the top of the motion, think about bending the bar to create tension. In all of those examples, though, I'm using words like bar, ceiling, and bench. I'm making no reference to the body. The body has to move to achieve those goals, but I allow the body, if you would, to self-organize simply by giving the body the goal itself. So this goal-oriented language, which is rich and comes in many forms and fashions, including, as we'll talk about later, analogies, we call those external cues. Now again, if you think about the type of language you use across the description, the cue, and the debrief, I guarantee that you have quite a few external cues. You reference the environment that the athlete or the client is looking to navigate all the time, right? So this creates the zoomed in to zoom out continuum we're talking about. But it is a continuum. So let's give a little bit of insight on how it flows together. If we zoom all the way into the body, as we're referring, we call those narrow internal cues. And this is where you're talking about a single joints motion. So flex your hip, flex or extend your knee, dorsiflex your ankle. Equally, this could be activate your quad, activate your stomach, squeeze your glutes, right? activate your calf, for example. Single joint, single muscle, those are narrow internal cues. We can then broaden those out, and rather than talking about a single joint, we can talk about a limb. So drive your leg back, drive your arm back, keep your body parallel to the ground, right? These are not inclusive of any one joint, but rather inclusive of multiple joints that make up a limb, 
or a segment of the body. They're internal though, because they're still body referenced. We can then pass the perimeter of the body and get into what we call a close external cue. So in the nature of sprinting here, it would be something to the effect of explode off the ground, drive the ground away, blast through the push, whatever it might be, but it references the ground being close to me. Equally, if I talked about a bench press, again, going back to it, drive the bar away from the bench. Because I'm talking about the bar away from the bench, it's something quite close. But, as you might have guessed, to go far away, with the bench press example, I could say drive the bar towards the ceiling. Well, the ceiling's a lot farther away than the bench. And theoretically, if I was to actually release the bar to the ceiling, that's going to take a lot more, or at least encourage a lot more power than bar away from bench. So as you might imagine, a far external cue might simply highlight the goal you're trying to achieve better, especially in the case of the bench press, if it is power. Here, in the case of the sprint, as you see on the screen, focus on exploding away from the blocks or away from the starting line. Well, the farther I move, the farther away that line is. So that becomes a far external cue. Equally, and probably more likely, focus on driving to and through the finish line, which might be 10 meters up the track or up the turf. Either way, it's a far external cue. Uh, just to give one other example, let's say from a racket sport or golf, Focusing on the physical racket or the club itself, that's going to be close. Focusing on the outcome I'm trying to achieve, i.e. hitting a ball to a specific location or a specific direction, focus on where the ball is going to land, either in the case of tennis or golf, that's going to be far. Okay, So this starts to create that continuum. Now the final category, call it on the continuum or at least sitting closely next to it, is what we refer to as an analogy. So in this case, I might say, I want you to explode off the ground like a cheetah is two feet behind you. And I think most certainly if a cheetah was two feet behind you, you'd be going pretty fast, or at least as fast as you could. Undoubtedly, you'd be caught. But by allowing this to fill the imagination, we can move as if. And you think about it, this figurative or visual or analogical language, we use it all the time. And so the reason I have analogy next to the external cue is that, we'll get to this, analogies, insofar as the way they impact movement, behave a lot like external cues. And that what I'm visualizing with the analogy is something literal or could be literal in the environment, experienced and goal-oriented. Whereas the external cues are simply referencing things that are actually around me. But if we know anything about the brain, we know that imagination and reality, oftentimes, in terms of the body's perception of them, can get quite closely matched, which is why analogies are such an amazing tool, because moving as if allows us to encourage the body to do some pretty cool things, as if we were able to change the world around them like the matrix. So the mind itself is a powerful tool in carving out better movement. Now, if we look at those, I want you to pause and take a moment to briefly consider the merits of internal versus external cueing. And again, from here on out, when I say external cueing, I want you to include analogies inside of that definition. So take a moment and just ask the following questions and go pen to paper if you can. Do they both have a place? And that is specifically when it comes to cueing, specifically as the idea that the athlete focuses on while they move, right back to the cue here, do they both have a place? Meaning as the last idea we put in the athlete's head, do both internal cues and external cues have a place? Take a moment and write down what you think. Pause the video to make sure you get your thoughts down. Two, if so, when would you use internal cues versus external cues? And you might even make a distinction of when you'd use analogies. Go ahead and again, pause the video and write those down. Uh, three, is one type of cue better than the other? So maybe you're thinking, well, gosh, I don't know if they all have a place, or at least I don't know if that place is equal. So if one type of cue is better than the other, which one is it? Another interesting way to think about this is, especially if you're working with someone from a sporting perspective, would you want your athletes focusing internally during a sporting competition? Or would you prefer them to be focusing externally? And if you do choose one over the other, you have to ask yourself, 
Well, if practice is meant to prepare the body for play, for competition, by those same merits, shouldn't it also train the mind in the same way that we want the mind to compete? And so that might put a little bit of challenge on you to think about the type of language you use when you coach. Again, pause the video and get your thoughts down. And then finally, if so, consider which type of cue is better and why. So if you do think one is better, why is it? Why would external be better than internal or equally internal better than external? Again, pause the video, get your thoughts down, and then we'll move on because I'm about to reveal my answers and the evidence answers to these questions. Okay, so we're back now. So we see up here I have my full continuum of cues. And I've given this presentation many different ways, and I think the most impactful way to deliver it is to give you the end and then defend the end. And thus, I want to show you what the research currently says and what my experience over the last 15 years has reinforced from a coaching language perspective. And that is the following, that when we look at what is now north of 150, 160 papers, there is no evidence to support the effectiveness of narrow internal cues when it comes to performance and learning compared to external cues. And that's the key here. It's not that people don't get better in motor learning studies, whether it was learning how to kick a ball, uh, hit a ball from a tennis perspective, or even lift weights. It's not that they don't get better. It's that simply when compared to external cues. External allows superior performance, and if a retention test is done a few days later with no cues at all, it seems that external cues also benefit there. Equally, even if we zoom out a little bit from a joint to a limb, same thing. Possibly there could be a benefit compared to narrow, but no one has really drawn out this distinction outside of one study on the broad jump. So currently these internal cues, whether broad or narrow, don't seem to give nearly the same level of learning benefit or learning equity as their external queuing neighbors. But something happens once we pass the perimeter of the body, whether it's a close external cue, a far external cue, or an analogy, the benefits around immediate performance and long-term learning really start to come to the fore. So there's conclusive evidence that focusing on external cues that are close to you, so the racket, the club, the barbell, the dumbbell, the medicine ball, the ground if I'm jumping, for example, or the ceiling if I'm trying to give a target, all of the rich environmental language that's near my body that allows me to understand how to move in space seems to be very helpful in the short term and the long run. Equally, if I'm trying to teach movements that require a lot of power or a lot of accuracy, from the case of, let's say, golf, a far external cue seems to be very beneficial. And when it comes to accuracy, the benefit of a far external cue really starts to increase with the more experience that I have. So the take home there is early on, close external cues benefit everybody. Far external cues benefit everybody when I'm trying to produce more power. Say for example, on a broad jump, rather than thinking about jumping away from a line that's close to me, put a cone out in front of them. Put a little bit of motivation through the distance and tell them explode out to the cone. That seems to benefit everybody. But when I'm doing high accuracy type things, let's say kicking or hitting, especially in the case of let's say baseball, golf, or tennis, far external cues seem to be more beneficial once an individual has reached a certain level of experience. Okay. Ultimately, that's the art in the coaching. And then finally, analogies, again, have been shown to be massively beneficial for learning. And in fact, with a single analogy, as we'll come to find, we can hide all sorts of biomechanical information that benefit movement without having to name that biomechanical information. Ultimately, if you just think about it, giving too much information causes paralysis by analysis. And what it seems to be is that by using external cues and analogies, I can hide a lot of that biomechanical information by establishing a really good goal with my language and allowing the body to figure out how to solve it. And some of the solutions on how to solve it can come in the way you word the cue or the analogy. And we'll come to that in the practical section of this presentation. 
So just reiterating my point in that top right corner, over 160 plus papers on this. And it's not like there's a 70-30 distribution. This is a principle of learning to move. External cues and analogies seem to be the language of movement, just as they are the language of coaching. Yeah, yeah, where's the proof? If I were you, and I was at one point, I remember when I first got this story shared with me, I asked, well, show me. Give me an insight here outside of my own intuition because the argument makes a lot of sense, but hold on, I have to be able to reference the body. I have to be able to talk about where a hip goes and knee goes. How can I teach movement if I can't talk about the body that is moving? And these are important questions, ones that I asked, and I'd be surprised if you're not asking them. Now, I'm gonna ask you to hold that because I wanna go through the proof and reveal it, and then you can make your conclusion at the end. But remember something that I said earlier. Even though I'm about to share the proof, it gives us an indication of why external cues and analogies are better than internal insofar as what you think about while you move. There is no reason why you can't have internal language in your description, describing and breaking down a movement, or in your debrief, especially if you're doing some kind of video analysis. So internal and external can live on the fringes of that coaching communication loop. What I'm going to encourage you through evidence and practical recommendations is simply have the external cues and analogies live in that cue by themselves, right? But we're getting ahead of ourselves. You can make that conclusion at the end once you've had all the evidence. First and foremost, what currently is going on? Now, there's a number of studies out there, I'm gonna share two, that have observed coaches and therapists in action to see how they currently communicate and the type of language that they use. So here I've taken one study that looked at gait re-education with physical therapists working with stroke rehabilitation and then those working in elite track and field. So all they did is look and examine at the communication they used in and around teaching movement. And what they found with our physical therapists is that 67% of the type of language they used from an instructional perspective came in the form of internal. 22% came in the form of external, and 11% didn't fall into either category. So they were motivational prompts or just general communication. Then Jared Porter, who's done quite a bit of research in this space, he looked at verbal instructions around elite track and field coaches and athletes. And what he found is 85% of coaches used internal language, and 15% primarily used external language. So it's not that they only used one or the other, but this was their primary form of communication. And what was really interesting is the coaches that primarily used internal language, well, that was the preferred focus that the athlete used in competition and vice versa with external. So it reinforces it in the same way that how we physically prepare the body in training is what we're physically prepared for in competition, well, how we focus in training is how we will focus in competition. So in your mind, if you say, well, I want a certain type of focus in competition, but I want to use a different type of focus in training, that doesn't really map up. And that juxtaposition needs to be challenged, right? Because in the same way that physical to physical, mental to mental also maps. While that's only two studies, I've been teaching this and working in a coach education capacity for quite a long time. And what I can say is this, not only is that indicative from a study perspective, it's also indicative of my own experience as a coach. So now that we understand where coaches and therapists currently put their communication, notably on one side of our communication continuum that we would say is non-ideal, let's start to look at the evidence that allows us to say that side of the communication continuum is not ideal. And we're going to go through a number of sections, just taking a high-level sampling of some various research. And we'll begin with the research around neuromuscular. So the type of stuff that us strength conditioning coaches do all the time. Let's begin with a study by Halperin. And Halperin put out a really nice paper utilizing a movement that many in SNC are gonna be familiar with. And that is this idea of an isometric mid-thigh pull. 
So he took individuals, I believe these were college students likely who had some level of strength training. So they were somewhat familiar with strength-based movements. And as you would in any coaching scenario, each person got to try on, so to speak, each of the cues. And they simply measured the force output that these individuals could create. Now, be certain that these cues were randomized, so not everyone always heard them in the exact same order. And each person got to do a couple repetitions under each cueing condition. So one of the conditions was a control condition. Go as hard and as fast as you can. One was the internal cue, contract your legs as hard and as fast as you can. And one was external, push the ground as hard and as fast as you can. Now this was an acute study looked at over, over one session, and here's what they found, that externally they could produce 9% greater force than internally, that externally produced 3% greater force than that control condition, and that control condition, where they were simply told to go as hard and as fast as they can, non-specific, produced 5% greater force than internal, and ultimately internal resulted in the least amount of force. And even in your own mind, Imagine performing a strength activity with these varied cues. I would imagine this maps to your intuition. So while this is one study, it echoes many other studies that could take its place. And that is research consistently shows that external cues improve muscular force, endurance, speed, and efficiency. And efficiency oftentimes is measured by EMG. That is external cues result in greater power, force, speed, and endurance, but less muscular activity so less energy expenditure, and thus more efficiency or economy of movement. Those are all valuable things just by shifting your language. Second, not only do we see an increase in strength or strength measures, but also power. Power is one of the better studied areas within external internal focus, again, notably by Jared Porter. So he's done a number of studies that looked at the broad jump or the horizontal jump where you start at a line and you try to jump out, landing on two feet as far as you can. And again, gives the athletes typically strength trained, you know, they're not, not elite jumpers per se. Sometimes they're in sports, sometimes they're not, but it doesn't change the outcome. But it gives the individuals in the study an internal cue and an external cue and sometimes a control. So here I pulled the two cues from one of his studies. Extend your knees as rapidly as possible or jump as far past the start line as possible. And again, this was done in one session. Look at the results. When the individuals focused externally, their average jump distance was 187.37 centimeters, plus or minus 42.66. And then internally, 177.33, plus or minus 40.97. Again, that standard deviation is large because you had participants of all different abilities. But what we see here in the average is clear. People jump farther when they use the external cue compared to the internal cue. Now you might be saying 10 centimeters, that's not huge, but let me remind you in all of these studies, they typically take place over one to maybe two to three days. So if we're getting that kind of a difference in one session, map that out over days, weeks, months, and years. And notably, map that against the kind of things you want your athletes thinking about, which I'm gonna argue are externally oriented in competition. Thus, the compounding benefit, we haven't even begun to measure what that might look like. And I reference my own experience. I've seen in the data improved results when the only thing I've shifted in my own coaching, notably of speed, preparing guys for the 40-yard dash at the NFL Combine, when my language is shifted and everything else remains, they run faster than when I coached, call it in my old way. So research consistently shows that external cues improve vertical, and horizontal jumping performance. Finally then, I noted earlier, got a PhD in this subject, and for me, what I focused my PhD efforts on was the impact of language on sprinting, nodding back to my time working in the NFL Combine development world. So working with my team, notably Ken Clark, Peter Wayand, and others at SMU, we went into a lab took both elite sprinters as well as collegiate soccer players. And we put them through a 10 meter sprint and we had everything to make sure that we were able to get down to the third decimal place, the accuracy of this time. 
over 10 meters out of a, out of a two point start, knowing that in one session over such a short distance, the differences, if they do exist, are going to be small. And sure enough, they were small, but consistent. So our cues here were as follows. Control, perform to the best of your ability. Internal, focus on driving your legs back as explosively as you can. And external, focus on driving the ground back as explosively as you can. So driving your legs back versus driving the ground back. Small difference. In this specific study here, we were looking at the male collegiate soccer players who most certainly are familiar with sprinting, even though they might not be sprint trained in the same essence of an elite sprinter. And what we see here is that externally and during that control condition, they could cover 10 meters on average in 2.14 seconds, but internally consistently 2.16 seconds. Now, people will look at these numbers and say those are so remarkably small. Well, one, the study was powered well enough. That means we had enough participants and the accuracy of our equipment was good enough that we know that both statistically and practically, that is a significant difference. If I go back to my NFL combine days, over the course of eight weeks, if we could improve someone's time by 0.1 of a second, over eight weeks, we were ecstatic. And that was a significant change. So early on, if you had told me there was a mechanism by way of changing how I coached, that in one session, just over 10 meters would shift that by two hundredths. Would I have wanted to know about that method? Absolutely. Again, these are small numbers, but these are single sessions. You have to think about the compounding element of this if we were looking longitudinally. So we've talked about strength and its various qualities, power and its various qualities. Now we're talking about speed. And most certainly we could have looked at agility. Again, Jared Porter has done some nice work in agility. External cues still come out on top. So from a movement performance and a neuromuscular output perspective, there's no question external cues seem to overpower internal cues in the short term and in my own experience, most certainly the long term. But that's just looking, if you would, at the raw material, the engine room of the body. We know that there are far more skillful movements with far more nuance and challenge. Again, the question is, do external cues win out over internal? Now, there's many studies that could take this place, but I think the soccer study here by Dr. Gabrielle Wolf, who truly is the superpower in motor learning research in general, but most certainly in the world of attentional focus, looking at the impact of our words on what athletes pay attention to. And this is one of her best studies, in my opinion, because it gives us a lot of strength behind the external cueing effect. So what she did here is she took novices who were looking to learn how to kick a ball or really loft a ball and hit a target. So a basic kicking activity. And there were four total groups. So let me explain. Two of the groups were going to be given external cues, and you can see them on the screen. And two of the groups were given internal cues. But Gabby Wolf wanted to find out, well, hold on. I wonder if how often we give the cue matters. So within the internal or within the external, they broke those groups up further into either receiving cues 100% of the time or 33% of the time. That would be every third repetition. And what's great about this study is they actually brought in coaches, people who are able to observe the movement, identify the most common error on the repetition, and provide the most relevant cue. So we had four groups, two and two, broken external, internal, and then within those, either receiving information 33% of the time or 100% of the time. The person giving that information was a certified coach. They only provide one cue at a time. Okay, what happened? over the course of the study. Well, here we see the blocks of five trials, one through six blocks. Then we see that space. That means that they gave them a day off, give or take. They were brought back in with no cueing, no reminders to see did they actually learn something. It's kind of like me working with my son on how to ride his bike. I'm there, I'm cueing, I'm coaching, I'm supporting, and then bringing him back a couple days later and saying, okay, son, off you go and saying nothing. What actually stuck? What was consolidated? what was put on the hard drive, so to speak. 
Now, we see the four lines that echo the four groups that I just explained. If you look at the key to the right, you can see external 100. That means they received the information 100% of the time. External 33, internal 33, and internal 100. And that, in fact, is the order of the lines. So our top two lines, which the higher they are in the graph, the more accurate the kicking was, so the better the kicking was, those top two lines are external. And as we can see, both practically and statistically, the, the groups that received external cues did better. They were more accurate in their kicking compared to the internal. And that result stayed. And in fact, we can see that they improved further as they went into the retention test. So insofar as external compared to internal, this tells the exact same story as I've been sharing. Here's what's really interesting though. It didn't matter whether or not we gave the cues, externally that is, 100% of the time or 33% of the time. Now that reinforces then that you probably don't need to be giving cues every single time someone moves. Intuitively, that makes a whole lot of sense. If you go back to my NFL Combine story, I was not only saying too much each time I queued, but I was queuing too often. I didn't give them time to actually consolidate, own the thought, and own the focus. So I would argue that we're trying to say the most with the least, both in the physical cue and how often we feel like we have to cue. But here's where the really interesting point in this study emerges, and that is the bottom two lines. If internal cueing is in fact negative, on performance compared to external. You'd argue the less internal cues someone gets, the better that they will do. And that's exactly what the study finds. If we look, and I'll highlight the lines here, if we look at our physical lines, this line here on top, the third line down, that is our 33% line. If I then drop to the line below it, that's our internal 100% line. So what this shows us is, those that only received internal language 33% of the time outperformed those that heard it 100% of the time, reinforcing that our po point and possibly pointing to a dose response, that the more internal language I get, especially for a complex movement like kicking, the worse I'm going to do. Now, there are many other studies we could look at there, and I would encourage you to dig into them. Gabby Wolf has written many of them. But let's now shift into a related area and that is injury and technique. Notably, when people get injured, there is this idea that when we go to retrain them, we have to retrain them almost like a baby, and we have to do this intellectually, getting them to think about the individual muscles and the joints involved in complex multi-joint movements. And it's not to say that there's not a role in calling out those muscles and calling out those joints, especially for local muscular activation and local joint range of motion. The question is, when we talk about retraining movement or regaining movement, how important is it to be talking about head, shoulders, knees, and toes? And equally, if you think about the cues that I've shared so far, a lot of people feel that they're fairly general. You know, extending one's hips, very specific. Exploding off the line in comparison to many feels general. So the question would be, do these external cues, if they are more general, and I'm going to argue you can get plenty specific with external once you understand the anatomy of a cue. But either way, do these general external cues result in more specific technical shifts than your specific internal cue? Well, let's take a look. So to begin with, I want to share some research from a gentleman named Rob Gray. So I've talked about Jared Porter. I've talked about Gabby Wolf. Rob Gray is another superpower in the space of motor learning. He's done some wonderful work around baseball and motor learning. And I think we've all heard that when, and, and the experience for ourselves, that when someone gets injured, they become overly focused on the area of injury. Now, if we think about it, if I'm focused on my area of injury while I'm trying to retrain, by its very nature, what am I focusing on? That's right, I'm focusing on the body. I'm focusing internally. So our intuition would say that injuries cause an internal focus. But no one had ever researched this. So Rob said, Lay, let's, let's take my context of baseball and in fact see once someone's recovered from an injury, does that injury continue to echo through their focus and possibly cause issues now that we know that what we focus on impacts how we move. So in this case, he started out with hitters. And some of the hitters 
had had knee injuries and some of the hitters had not. So both of those groups were elite. They knew how to hit, right? They were experienced. They were not novices. But Rob also brought in a group of novices as well. So technically there were three groups. We are just going to focus on the injured and the non-injured expert hitting group, if you would. And so what, what Rob does here is something really interesting, is he uses a hitting simulator. And you'll have to take my word on it because the research exists. And that is this hitting simulator has been shown to transfer to live hitting and I believe live pitching. But within it then is given us an indication of being able to control the learning environment. So even though it is a simulator, what I'm about to talk to, understand that it still relates to the live activity of hitting. That's very important for, if you would, the ecology or the environmental validity of these studies. Okay, so I'm going to spend some time explaining this because it's important that you understand. I'm going to bring this type of study up again later on. And so they're in a hitting simulator. They're swinging a real bat, right? So the actual experience of swinging is real. And there's even, I believe, a, a, a sound effect when they make contact with the ball. And so they're in a hitting simulator. And what Rob does is within a few milliseconds of, of a swing beginning, a tone, a noise goes off. Now the person's meant to notice the noise but continue on with the swing. Now after the noise goes off, Rob will then ask the hitter either a question about their elbow position, their knee position, or the flight of the ball moving to the left or to the right of a visual target. Now let me be clear, the hitters do not know which question he is going to ask at the end. So the tone goes off at some random time point, plus or minus a few milliseconds within the swing, but they do not know if they're going to be asked the question around elbow motion, knee motion, or the flight of the ball going to the left or to the right of a target that is on the screen. Okay, so that's the context. And he gets enough repetitions of each of these categories randomly throughout to understand what the person naturally is focusing on. That is, the more accurate you are at knowing what the elbow, the knee, and or the ball is doing, even though I have not given you any cues, that gives me an indication of what you are paying attention to while you swing, at least in a relative sense. And so from a study perspective, Here's the graph, and let me just orient you with the graph. The black lines, right, those are the injured individuals who are expert hitters, but they are recovering from a knee injury in the case of hitting. You then have the white bars. Those are your expert control. So they're also expert hitters, but they are not injured. And then you kind of have the grayish bar, and that's your novice control. We're not going to pay attention to that final one. We're just going to look at the black and the white one. And so let's start with the arm, for example. So we'll look at the first column of data. And here, the higher the bar is, the higher the bar is, the more correct, call them guesses or not, but the more accurate the person was in knowing what either the elbow, the arm, or the ball was doing. And it was the same question for each one. And so here we can see that when asked about what the arm was doing, that the accuracy of the injured and non-injured experts was comparable. But it appears that the injured individuals knew a little bit more of what was going on at the arm. We then move over to the ball. And what do we see? That our experts were far more accurate in knowing whether or not the ball was moving to the left or to the right of the target compared to their injured equivalents. Now, I don't know about you, but when it comes to baseball or any other kind of accuracy type sport, especially when I need to hit something that's moving at me, knowing the motion of the ball suggests to me that they're focusing on the right thing because ultimately the ball is what they're trying to interact with. So that's our first interesting finding. Why is it that a knee injury would impact that? Well, if they're not focusing on the ball, what are they focusing on? And that brings us right here to the middle graph. And what we can see here is, again, remember, these were knee injuries. Those who were injured knew what their knee was doing 
with far more accuracy than their non-injured equivalents. Now, whether or not it's a trade-off one-to-one of folks on knee versus ball, I do not know. But it's very clear here that if someone, in the case of hitting, has a knee injury, even though they're no longer injured, that that is acquiring more of their attention than if they had not been injured. And ultimately, when you compare that to the ball focus naturally achieved by the non-injured equivalents, it points to the fact that injuries, by their very nature, are reinforcing an internal focus. Now, attach that to the one piece of evidence on physical therapists, primarily using an internal focus, and coaches in general using an internal focus. And knowing that psychologically speaking, we're trying to get the athlete out of the injury into the environment, focusing on the outcomes they are trying to achieve. If we think about this, now it reinforces the importance of using external cues, notably in a return to performance or return to play environment. Now, Rob wasn't going to be satisfied with a one-off. So he wanted to see if this finding held when he looked at pitchers. So instead of bringing in, obviously, pitchers with knee injuries, what's more common? You got it. An elbow injury. So same three groups, injured and non-injured experts, plus that control. And again, we're just going to focus on injured and non-injured expert pitchers. Again, working in a simulator. Same exact idea. There was going to be that tone at some point in the pitching motion where they either asked a question on the motion of their elbow, motion of their knee, or the movement of the ball. Again, to the left or the right of a target. If we go back to the data, again, let's start with the leg. We see here that the injured individuals were better at knowing what their leg was doing compared to the non-injured equivalents. Once again, same trend. We see that the non-injured were far better at knowing what the ball was doing compared to the injured equivalents. And then finally, the punchline, so to speak, the injured were far better at knowing what the arm was doing, again, compared to the non-injured. So generally, in this case, the injured individuals knew what the, their arm and what their leg were doing far better than the non-injured, and then vice versa. The ball focus of pitching, which you think would dominate, does dominate in terms of awareness when it comes to non-injured, and there seems to be some level of a regression away from that in part. Whether or not it impacts performance, I do not know, but does regress away from it from an injured perspective. So ultimately, we see that that arm focus just like there was the leg focus in the hitters, is there. So in summary, this reinforces a profound argument for externally oriented cueing, especially from a return to perform perspective. So this requires both our physical therapists and coaches to upgrade how they coach, but doing so in service of how the athlete thinks. We can never forget this. Our language turns into their thoughts, or at least nudges their thoughts, which ultimately impacts the way they move. Now, along similar lines, as we said earlier, what about technique? Well, Gokler and Benjamins and colleagues have done some great work looking at those who are susceptible to ACL or possibly are returning from an ACL. And so here we look at a group of individuals who had returned from an ACL being compared to healthy equivalents, similar enough to Rob's study. And what they were doing is not dissimilar to Jared Porter. They would hop out and land. So think of it kind of like a horizontal hopping type of emotion. Again, we see the cues right here. I want you to think about extending your knees as rapidly as possible, or I want you to think about pushing yourself off as hard as possible from the floor. Arguably, both of these folks on the takeoff, but they were assessing the landing, the part of the motion from an ACL perspective that we know has an increased risk of ACL injury or re-injury. We could also argue, though, that the internal cue is far more specific than the external cue if we had a continuum of specific to general. And you can see the, the table below, and I've highlighted a couple of these key numbers. What I love about this study is they brought the biomechanical rigor that so many people argue against external cues. 
And that is, well, how can a general cue result in a specific change in movement? Well, let's take a look. We can see we have non-injured and injured. Let's start with jump distance. Well, it appears that the external focus effect holds. People in a single session, remember that, jump farther with external cues than they do with internal. Now let's look at some of these biomechanical markers that we know relate to possible ACL injury risk. So peak knee valgus angle. That is how far that knock kneed position goes in. And if we look at our numbers here, we can see if we just look at the non-injured, well, that number is smaller for the external focus than it is for the internal focus. And we see the exact same thing from the injured perspective. If we then drop down to peak knee flexion angle, again, arguably the more I'm flexing through that knee, the longer I'm absorbing that force, the lowered risk of ACL injury. Well, once again, we see greater knee flexion with the external compared to internal on both injured and non-injured individuals. And then finally, the time I take to go through that flexion, again, gives me some indication likely of control. If I'm rapidly decelerating, could that be a risk factor? Absolutely. So once again, we see not only more flexion, but over greater period of time for injured and non-injured. So what's interesting is the cues focused on the takeoff, yet the assessment was, let's say here, on the landing. And when we look at these specific cues, ultimately we're seeing that a general cue, if you want to call that, in the form of external, is resulting in a highly specific change in the movement pattern. So this whole idea that we have to be one-to-one -one calling out the joint or the muscle to make a change in that joint or muscle is an absolute myth and misnomer. Again, we can get that detail through the right phrasing of a cue once we know the anatomy of it. The final area that I'd like to talk about goes back to that initial question, and that is, would, are you using cues in training that in fact you would want your athlete, if you're working with athletes, to use in competition? Because ultimately we cannot argue that the way we train our body is aligned to how we want them to compete if we're not doing the same thing with the mind. Ultimately the mind and the body are connected. So here we are going to revisit Mr. Rob Gray in his hitting simulator. And what he did here is he took in, once again, a bunch of expert hitters. And same exact kind of idea. They would swing. At some point during the swing, there would be a tone. And he would ask them questions around, in this case, bat motion, whether the bat was moving up or down or some kind of equivalent question. And he wasn't providing any cues. He was simply trying to get an organic, kind of National Geographic style assessment of where attention was during the swing under varied conditions of pressure and performance. And so here's what he found. When he looked over hundreds and hundreds of swings, he found segments where these hitters were in a streak. They were successfully making contact with the ball and putting it into play versus when they were in a slump. They weren't making a contact with the ball. They weren't putting it into play. And he was able to categorically say, this is a phase of streak. This was a phase of slump. And within those phases, because he was assessing what they were focusing on, he was able to see when you're in a streak versus a slump, does it change your ability to know what, in this case, the bat is doing? And here's what he found. When someone was in a hitting streak, they made more errors in assessing what the bat was doing which means they were less accurate in knowing what the bat was doing when asked to recall. Conversely, when they were in a slump, when their hitting wasn't going well, their errors around knowing what the bat was doing decreased, which means when they were in the slump, they were more accurate in knowing exactly what the bat was doing, i.e. the lowered errors. Now, you might be thinking, Nick, isn't bat motion an external cue? Ah, yes it is for a novice. However, if I'm an expert, whether it be tennis, golf, baseball, that bat and body start to become one. So the bat becomes a formed 
inside the movement itself. So in this case, should I be focusing on the bat? Do I need to be focusing on the bat if I'm an expert hitter? No, I'm focusing on the ball, the pitcher, the release, and then obviously the contact and where that ball is going. So ultimately in this case, when we see the slump result in more natural focus on the bat, chicken or egg here, or maybe it's the other way around, either way, we see them starting to go more micro. We see them starting to go more inward, focusing on implicitly the technique of the movement itself, rather than the outcome that technique is trying to achieve. So arguably the attention, possibly, away from the ball or away from some external uh, feature, possibly the release point of the pitcher, is in part the reason for the slump, or the slump could have come about by random chance alone, and the way we implicitly think we can fix it is by going back to our roots, back to the body, back to the technique. Either way, the performance is going down. And in the case of the slump to streak, we've got to get them out of their body, back into the environment, i.e., in this case, probably a far external cue. Now, interestingly enough, when Rob put pressure on a group of individuals, again, expert hitters, and so they're being filmed, they're told if they get a certain accuracy rate that they're going to get paid and someone else is going to get paid, they threw the pressure book at these individuals. They found a very similar trend. And that is when no pressure is put on these individuals, they only make errors about 39% of the time when it comes again to that bat motion. However, when the pressure is on, they're only making errors 18% of the time. That means when the pressure comes on, they are more accurate in knowing what the bat as an extension of the body is doing. And so it seems that when I'm in high pressured or slump scenarios, when I'm trying to perform at my best, for one reason or another, the architecture of my downfall is where I am focusing. And that, in this case, is akin to internal body movement focus rather than the outcome that body, in this case, ball contact, trajectory, and endpoint that I'm trying to achieve. Now, this is one study of what could have been many other studies that has taken its place. And it comes to this whole idea around pressure-based research and choking-based research. Uh, Sian Bylock has done quite a bit in this space. And that is we tend to go inward. We reinvest our attention and our body and our movements internally when we are in either positions of choking or pressure. And thus the greatest athletes, and thus the coaches who are helping athletes to become great, learn how to condition the mind to stay out in the environment, out in the outcome, the goal that my body is trying to achieve, get out of the body's way. And if you read the great books like The Inner Game of Tennis by Timothy Galway, who I profile throughout my book, The Language of Coaching, that's exactly what he was saying back in 1974. So external cues not only help performance and learning, but they condition the mind to get out of the body's way. Establish the GPS endpoint, establish the goal, and allow the body to achieve it. Even with our previous research from Gokler and Benjamins on technique, we see the body finds a way. We can give general goals and get very specific movement outcomes. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, well, is there any place for internal? Is there a future outside of its home in that description or that debrief? And I think there might be a home, so let me explain. This study illustrates nicely, for one, why external cues are so valuable and why internal cues can be so detrimental. At the same time, it nods to possibly one of the benefits of internal cueing in very specific contexts. And so here we take a sample of EMG, so muscle activation readings, from a study done by Keith Lose. And what he did is he set individuals up in what more or less was a modified calf extension type of a movement, so plantar flexion, pointing your toe, okay? And so the foot was on a force platform and everything was fixed, so it was isometric. So even though I could produce force, there was no motion involved. And participants tried two different cues, right? In one case, they were focusing on pushing on the plate, and another one they were focusing on squeezing or activating the calf muscle. Okay, so push the plate, that's external, that's the goal. Activate or squeeze the calf muscle, that's the internal body oriented. And so what we see is 
The left column is the external cueing repetitions, and the right column is the internal cueing repetitions. And this is a sample from three subjects. You can see subject three, eight, and four right along this left side column. And so if we just focus here on subject three, we can see that during the external, the soleus, which is one of the calf muscles, we see a good stream of activation on the top. And then we see this tibialis anterior, that's the, the muscle in front of the shin. Call it the antagonist to the soleus. It's silent, and that makes a whole lot of sense. If I'm trying to flex the muscle in the back to, in this case, push something forward, or in the case of walking, push me forward, or even jumping, push me up, I don't want the muscle in the front resisting. I think of it similarly, if I have the glutes in the back of my hips firing, I don't want the hip flexors in the front firing. That's like having a handbrake on while trying to drive the car. But if we move over here to the internal cueing, what do we notice? One, we see, yes, more activation of the calf, the soleus specifically, <clears throat> but we also see greater activation of the tibialis anterior. So maybe part of the reason that the calf, the soleus, has to fire more is to overcome the activation, the parking brake on the front. So what does this start to show us? Well, very simply put, it aligns with Gabrielle Wolf's constrained action hypothesis. And that is when I give an internal cue, it constrains the motor system, which means it literally restricts the motor system's ability to move, or at the very least move efficiently. And that makes sense. That when I give an internal cue, the body motion becomes the goal, not the goal, right? What do I mean by that? If I tell you to squeeze the glute, squeezing the glute becomes the goal, but jumping high, which is the actual goal I'm trying to achieve, becomes downgraded in the mind's eye, assuming that the person completely focuses on it. So within this then, when I give an internal cue, it causes co-contraction, literally activation around the joints generally involved with the muscle or the joint that I'm calling upon, basically bringing in as if you're pulling the handbrake on the body, on your car, when you're on the freeway, when you're on the motorway, and it reduces efficiency and quality of movement. So it's not that we don't get better with internal cues, as I've been saying you do, but your body seems to have to work a lot harder, less efficiently, and it doesn't seem to be nearly as sticky as when we use external cues. But by that same logic, if you were to say, I want more muscle activation, I want more local joint co-contraction, and I'm thinking single joint muscular activities for hypertrophy, or real early phase rehabilitation, where you're trying to get better co-contraction around a joint, or better, better activation in a singular, singular muscle, you might be able to make the argument for internal cueing. However, categorically, I think these are very small minority of the amount of times that I'm actually going to be cueing. And thus, if I'm worried about movement quality, movement performance, from the simplest thing like a single leg RDL to a complex thing like hitting a baseball or sprinting in action, we have to make the argument for an external cue. And even in the case of some of these minutia single joint motions, I would still argue that an external cue is gonna win out because efficiency, force production, endurance seem to be in favor of an external cue. But the jury is still out on some of these call them micro movements. But at the macro level, which consumes the vast majority of what you're teaching, especially when someone is injured, as we talked about, external cues are remarkably important. So, first major point we gave you, it was just that. Give one cue, one point at a time, before the person moves. Otherwise, we're asking them to choose, possibly overloading their attention. So one cue, and when we give that one cue, let's make it external, or as we'll talk about here in a moment, an analogy. Allow that cue to ride, watch its echo throughout the movement, and therein lies the evidence you need to confirm the cue, to update it or refresh it all together. But either way, the evidence is clear that external cues are the best friend of movement. They are the language of movement, and that's why we say they are the language of coaching. Now, if I was to leave you there with just one cue in making it external, I think you'd be able to take that and run. However, the vast majority of my time, once I learned those principles, 
was spent learning how to bring that into my coaching behavior. It's one thing to know that external cues are superior to internal when it comes to motor learning. It's a whole nother thing to be able to have your brain calibrated to coming up with external cues on the fly, especially when you've tried every cue in your language locker and for whatever reason they don't seem to be working on that day. And so after giving it a lot of thought, and I observed this, right, in my own language, I found that there are three major components that exist within an external cue, or at least the long form of an external cue. And once you've identified these three components, what you quickly realize is you, you can modify them very easily to update cues. And even by knowing the three of them, create brand new cues right off the cuff versus only being constrained to the cues you heard as an athlete or the ones you've learned from other individuals. And so the cool thing is we've been talking about this cueing anatomy all throughout this presentation, but now we're going to name it. And that is the 3D cueing model. That's it. Three Ds in the mind supporting three-dimensional movement. And so the three Ds are distance. Is the cue encouraging me to focus on something close versus far? Simple. Direction. Am I going towards something or away from something? So think of distance and direction as helping your client, your athlete, navigate the space. Where am I trying to move? Okay. And then the third one is the description. And the description is either the action word, the verb embedded in the cue, or the physical use of an analogy, move as if, to bring that verb to life in a visual form in the mind's eye. And so if the distance and direction work together to tell me where I'm moving in space, the description gives me an indication of how to get there. Fast or slow, I just don't know. The description ensures they know. Push, drive, punch, explode, blast, right? All of these action words have a biomechanical reverberation. Even the words push versus punch, just reflect on them. Do those words feel the same? Much more what they think or the meaning, but push and punch, do they feel the same as they reverberate through your body? No, they don't. Push is a much slower word in its sense, or the sense it gives us, than the word punch. So we'll talk about this more the verbs we use literally contain the vast majority of the biomechanical information the body needs to get those specific changes, right? So distance and direction, space, where am I going? Description, how will I get there? Am I driving a Porsche, a Prius? Am I off-roading, four-wheelers? What's going on today? And what's cool is I can change that distance from close, push the bar away from the bench, to far, drive the bar to the ceiling. Direction, get away from the line in the sprint versus toward the finish. Uh, Description, explode off the line, drive off the line, blast off the line. I can start to shift the physical verbs I'm using as well or insert an analogy. So each of these sections give us an indication of an element of the cue that we can shift. Now that we've looked at the three Ds, let's look at them in application. So here we have someone sprinting and we come up with a baseline cue. Focus on being quick off the ground. If we look at the cue, we can find the three Ds. So the quick is the how I want them to move. Uh, the off is the direction, because I'm moving away from something. Off is a preposition, and all of our directional words are prepositions by their nature. And then the ground tells me where I'm moving in space, and the ground is close to me in this case. So focus on being quick off the ground has all three Ds. Now, if you think about this, I can just change any one or all of these ingredients, so to speak, to refresh the cue, but still preserve the exact same meaning. It's kind of like you can make three different types of bread, and there are three different recipes, but at the end of the day, they're still bread. Similar idea here with your cues. So, in this case, the refreshed cue, or the different recipe, if you would, focus on driving hard toward the finish. So, Hard now is, driving hard is the how, right? They work together. It's not always one verb. Uh, toward is the direction. So instead of away from something, I'm going toward. And then finish is the distance. It's far away. Now, you don't always have to change all three Ds, but in this case, for effect, I did. 
So the meaning is preserved. I'm trying to be explosive in the direction that I am moving, but in one case, I'm going away from something, and in another case, I'm going toward. Now, just look at these two cues by themselves and make your own decision. Which one would you prefer? I guarantee if we poll every single person that looks at this slide, you're not gonna get 100% of everybody just wanting one of those cues. There's probably gonna be a pretty even split. By that very nature, that reinforces why it's so important to customize the cue to the person you're working with. Let's zoom into each D now, give it its own time. So distance, here we go. Push the ground back with as much force as possible. Right? So the ground is close. Explode through the finish with as much speed as possible. So the finish is now far, close versus far. With baseball, I could focus on contact with the ball. That's close. Or even swing path if I was working with a novice of the bat. Far would be trajectory end point of the ball. You could use a similar example in golf or tennis. What about direction? Well, in this case, I use my Q-tape system. So in the book, we talk about the 3D cueing system, but we also talk about the Q-tape system. And the Q-tape system is, is really simple. It's if you have some sticky tape, think of it as your strapping tape or the type of tape you put around an ankle from an athletic therapy perspective. And let's say I want to talk about knee motion in the case of sprinting. Pretty difficult to talk about knee motion because the knee is just moving freely in space. So here's what we do. Rather than mentioning the knee, we put a piece of tape on it, literally a piece of tape. That green dot you can see here on the screen represents just a piece of sticky tape. And I can say drive the green tape or just drive the tape toward the finish as fast as you can or drive the tape away from the start line as fast as you can. Right, toward is the toward direction, away is the away direction. So we're manipulating direction, but through the Q-tape system. Now you might be thinking, one, how's that gonna make a difference? The piece of tape is right on the knee. Well, for whatever reason, the way we actually analyze or assess or interpret a word like tape is very different than when we assess or interpret the word like knee. Knee is our knee, it's ownership. And we start to think about controlling that area of the body versus a piece of tape is like a piece of clothing, which can be used as a surrogate within the tape system. And so research has now shown, funny enough, a high jump study put a piece of tape right in front of the belly button and told them to lead with the piece of tape versus leading with the hips or staying tall. And that was enough to change the vertical force profile on takeoff in the high jump. And I can tell you right now, I've been utilizing tape in my own coaching, notably during the NFL combine development period, of teaching sprinting and it just unlocks movement brilliantly because I can connect one piece of tape on one part of the body to somewhere in the environment and the movement triangulates around that, self-organizes and I get that very specific cue but I'm able to still put it through an external cueing lens. So there's a lot more to be said around the cue tape system and I go over it in detail within the book but know that you can use that piece of tape if you would, to work on those nuanced movements where you can't come up with an external cue. But here we've also illustrated direction, toward versus away. And then finally, description. As I've been saying, we can change the verb. Push, drive, punch, blast, explode. Many others could take the place. Or we can look at analogies. So here I'm just gonna give two examples of an analogy instead of a verb. So explode out, right, there's the verb, but like, or as if, in this case like, a cheetah is two steps behind you. We talked about that one earlier. Or explode out and up like a jet taking off from an aircraft carrier. We can imagine the cheetah is going to encourage the speed of movement. And the like a jet taking off from an aircraft carrier is going to encourage the quality of a movement. In that a jet goes from low to high very explosively with a strong firm frame straight lines. Well, just in that little description, I could just as easily be describing sprinting as I am a jet taking off. So the beauty of analogies, as we'll talk about here in a second, are that they map onto the movement without you having to think about the movement, which is why analogies and verbs, if you would, are the heartbeat of any cue. They hide all that biomechanical information, giving me an implicit understanding of how to move in space. So in the book, we go through these in great detail. If you're feeling that that was quite quick, it was, and it was only one example. But what I do in the book is I actually walk you through how to apply those three Ds in depth and give you plenty of activities in the book to do it yourself.
right? So when I say that the book is designed to change behavior, it is. It's not like you read it and then start applying it. No, as you read it, you're prompted to apply the principles in real time. And one of the ways I help you apply the principles of the 3D queuing model is this idea of a language lock. And that think of each movement, and each movement has a combination, and that combination comes in their focus. If I get the focus right, the movement will unlock. And so a focus is dependent on where I'm moving in space and how I'm moving there. Our cue then has those three elements and thus those three combinations of description, direction, and distance. If I get the right combination of these three ingredients right through the cue, then fundamentally I will unlock the movement. The key is to find the right combination. And let me be very clear, this is where the art sits in the art and the science of coaching. And that I cannot tell you that there is one formula. All I can say is we have these three ingredients and you can manipulate these three ingredients and the combinations and you fight the right, you find the right combination and click, click, you're unlocking that movement. And in practice, what do we call that? We call it the light bulb moment. We've all felt it when we got the cue right. And they look back at us and say, finally, I get it. I've always known what you wanted me to do, but I couldn't feel it. And oftentimes our language can be a route to getting the mind and the body to work better together. Finding the right combination unlocks the movement. Now, we've gone through our attention. We've gone through our external cues. I'd like to finish up and focus in on analogies, right? Analogies are supercharged cues because analogies are figurative, right? They're non-literal, which means you have the infinity of the imagination to come up with ideas that, if they were in the real environment, would force that body to change. If there was actually a cheetah behind you, it would force you to, to move differently. If there was literally a wall in front of you when you were doing your Olympic lift, it would force you to move differently. If you had a book on the top of your head as you were backpedaling, it would force you to move differently. So analogies allow us to create, if you would, these constraints in the mind to move as if, and they're so powerful. And I'd argue, if you think back to your favorite teachers, your favorite coaches, they were storytellers. They might have been fantastic at programming and putting the right conditions around you, but ultimately, if they were truly memorable, they developed a positive relationship with you and left you in a better place than when you came in, I would argue that their communication skills were fantastic. They made things feel simple, they met you where you were at and they included you in the learning process. And ultimately, we like to think and focus on things that are interesting, that are fun, and are helpful. These are all words that describe analogies. So when we look at analogies, what are they? I don't want to make any assumptions here. Simply, an analogy is nothing more than a comparison between something we are familiar with and something we are not. So oftentimes you see the brain analogize to a computer, a computer chip, right? We use analogies all throughout our life. We use something like five or six analogies a minute in normal day-to-day -day conversation. But why when we step onto the coaching pitch or into the therapy room, does our language become dry, biomechanical, and internal? We should be conversing with people as people first. And analogies are a common form of the way we communicate the more we can bring them into our vernacular, into our conversation when we're coaching, the better, right? So ultimately, we can take something that your athlete or your client or your patient is familiar with, a jet, a cheetah, and use it to help them understand something that they're not or that they're at least less familiar with. A lot of people haven't been taught how to sprint. Maybe someone has never been taught how to squat or single leg squat. People who have had a stroke are having to relearn how to walk when they never had to consciously think about it in the first place. These are all conditions where taking the mind's former and using it, their past, to help them optimize their present. So when we look at this, it is helpful just to briefly consider why analogies are so generally powerful for thinking, let alone coaching and learning movement. So I want you to imagine for a second that we have a baby, okay? And with this baby, they're experiencing something for the first time. And because the Winkelmans are English bulldog owners, we are gonna use the English bulldog. 
because both of my children got to meet one for the first time before they were verbal, right? So when you're born into this world, you can't speak a language, which is why you can learn to speak any language, and that's beautiful, but what you are born with are senses. So when my baby, my daughter, my son, first met our bulldog, we had Keg and now we have Mango, they were able to see the bulldog, even though they didn't know the name, meaning they didn't know the word animal, they didn't know the word dog, and they didn't know the word mango, right? The name of the dog. So, but they could see it. They could most certainly hear the animal. They most certainly could smell the animal, especially living here in Ireland when they come in wet and dirty. And finally, they most certainly could cuddle and feel that animal, okay? Especially when they got the warm cuddles and the lick on the face. So my son, my daughter, learned about this animal, and it could be anything. It could be a piece of fruit. It could be a chair. It could be a ball. It could be a bed. It's all the same. They first understood this thing in terms of their senses, sight, sound, smell, and touch. And only then, once they learned through their senses, did they inevitably realize that there is a label for all of those collective senses, and we call it a dog. So we experience the world first, and then we get a label, not the other way around. Ultimately, though, once I have that label, I can say the word dog to mom or dad, and they understand immediately when they hear that word, the sight of a dog, the sound of a dog, the smell of a dog, and the feel of a dog. All of those things can be evoked by the word. But that word can only evoke these visuals once it has been earned. Well, why is this important? It's important because language is only as valuable as the meaning we give it. And thus, each of our words are little containers filled with sensory motor information. Why then is language so important? Well, if I use language that you are unfamiliar with, or less familiar with, meaning you haven't had experiences by which that label, that word, is warranted. Well, when I use that language with you, it doesn't mean anything because you have nothing to anchor it against. Conversely, if I use language, if I use words that are remarkably powerful for you, that are connected to experiences, lived, real experiences, that you value, that are important, that are laced with emotional hashtags, those words are really going to, as we say, move you. And just to illustrate the power of words and the meaning we give them, I want to tell you a short story. Go back to the beginning of this presentation. I told you that I was a personal trainer at university, and I had one client that I have never forgotten. And we sat down with this client, and we were going through the normal intake of his background, his goals, how many sessions we would do a week, all these kind of things. And I'll never forget, I asked him about his goals. And he said something that I felt at the time was quite odd, but inevitably I understood. And that is, well, he says to me, you have to understand, my wife and I are separated. And I have, I believe it was a five-year-old son. I have a five-year-old son. And he has a poster in his room of Superman. And he absolutely looks up to Superman and loves it. And if I'm honest with you, that's my goal. I am here because I want to do everything I can to be his Superman. So for this gentleman, the word Superman, oh, meant so much. It was more than just a character. Inside his little Superman box, as you see on my screen, he had his son's love. He had his son's admiration. He has his relationship and connection with his son anchored to this word. That's what it means to him. That's what his lived experience has resulted in, and this is the label he's given it. And so we had a day where we were working on an RDL, single leg RDL. So he's trying to hinge at his hip, balance on one leg, and more or less from head to heel, stay straight, like a teeter-totter, or someone might say, like Superman jumping off a building. And so what I said to him is I said, okay, as you come down flat, I want you to think about getting long 
like Superman jumping off a building, going out, reaching out, staying long to catch Lois Lane. And sure enough, on his next repetition, he was flat as a board. He was flying out like Superman as he hit that low position. And as he came up, he had tears in his eyes and he said, thank you. And what this shows is a couple things. One, I was able to take his familiar, Superman, and his knowledge of the body positions Superman gets in and map that, apply it to this movement we were teaching. The, the movement itself didn't have a lot of meaning, but it soon took on greater meaning when I used that analogy. And this also illustrates something powerful that I've yet to mention so far. And that is when we use our client's language, when we use their words, their stories, and repeat them back to teach them in the form of analogy, we implicitly build a bridge towards better relationships and connections. By its very nature, he knew I listened to him, and not just superficially, deeply, because we had probably had the conversation about Superman a few weeks earlier. And so I want you to think about your language, not only as a bridge to build better movement, but a bridge to connection, to relationship, and to long-lasting engagements that matter far more than just the movements that you teach. So with that story, we start to illustrate that language quite literally is connected to our senses. It's connected to our movement. It's because of those senses and the movements that we can even give them a label. And what we now know is this, that language processing then is distributed throughout the brain such that words are processed in the same brain regions responsible for bringing their meaning to life. Now think about that. Quite interesting. What do I mean by that? Well, simply put, if you were to kick a ball or watch someone kick a ball or think about kicking the ball or hear the word kick or write down the word kick, the parts of the brain Notably, that middle part of the brain called your primary motor cortex, where I have the little emoji of the person walking, the exact same part of your brain lights up in all four of those conditions. So it doesn't matter whether you're kicking, thinking about kicking, or hearing the word kick. They all use the part of the brain responsible for physically kicking a ball. And thus, when I use language, notably these verbs, these action words, or these visuals in the form of analogy, I'm tapping the mental machinery responsible for bringing that movement to life. So equally, when I use unfamiliar words or unfamiliar analogies, or I don't use analogies at all, I don't make any attempt to connect their past to their present, I am losing out on one of the most powerful language movement connectors that we have, and that is that language is processed in the same parts of the brain responsible for bringing their meaning to life. All you have to do is start to tap in to your client's familiar to help them learn the unfamiliar. That is the bridge, that is the power of analogy. So we understand this then as an idea of embodied simulation, that literally when we hear words and phrases, our brain is processing those words and phrases as if we were actually doing or seeing that thing. So we simulate seeing the scenes and performing the actions being described by using our motor, perceptual, and our emotional systems. So when this person hears, dive for the ball, if you would, there's this implied analysis of it where they are physically diving for the ball. That's why we say move like, move as if. We get the simulated rep, which then allows them to generate the physical rep. When I say get long like Superman, my client was able to see that position, and my body could pull all that matrix code out from that visual and apply it to the physical movement itself. I feel that endpoint rather than having to think about all the details of the head, the spine, the hip, the knee, and the ankle. It is implied. I set the goal, that's my job from a thinking part of it, and the body delivers the movement. That's its responsibility. It's part of the bargain. Interesting then, 
This is why unfamiliar language in general, even when spoken in our native tongue, is so difficult to understand and apply as we've yet to etch it into our brain. Now, I went from coaching in the United States to coaching where I live now in Dublin, Ireland. And even though we both speak English, we speak a different form of English, where the words I use, for example, I'd say the things I put on my feet to play a game are called cleats. They call them boots. They also call what I call the trunk the boot. And when I go to a restaurant, what I would call chips, they would typically call crisps. And what I would call fries, they typically would call chips. And so you can see all the confusion. If all my analogies are embedded in language, I have to, if you would, relearn language. But here's the cool thing. Using the 3D queuing model and the analogy model we're about to go through, I was able to quickly adapt. So I was speaking literally the language of my athletes, making sure the words I was using was making a positive impact on the movements they were performing. So how does our language then impact our athletes or our clients? Well, very simply, if you look at all these words, you know, un unless you're a mechanic or unless you're a computer scientist or unless you are someone that works in and around sinks and drains and whatnot, I would imagine these words don't have a lot of meaning. So do they have meaning to some people? Sure, to some people they have deep meaning. But for those of us not familiar with plumbing, computer science, or vehicles, these words might as well be coming from another language. And what it illustrates is, again, meaning is only what we apply to that language. We must have an experience first, and then we give it a label. So if I haven't had these experiences, I'm not going to be familiar with these labels, with these words, which means they are meaningless by definition to me. So this reinforces why we need to use familiar language. Familiar language lowers the barrier to learning by connecting new concepts to ones that already exist within the mind. That, by definition, is the use of analogy, or using external cues, which reference the literal environment around me that I can see, that I can feel, that I can engage with. By that very definition, they will be familiar with those objects. Equally, go through these words real quick. Take a moment, and I want you to write down, assuming you haven't looked at the slides, what image pops to mind when you hear these words, when you read these words. Pause the slide and write those down. Now, if you're back with me, what do they show? Well, when I hear the word blast, I think of this massive explosion like a rocket to the sky. Snap, I think the snap of a pencil. Burst, I think the burst of a balloon. Drive, I think of that impact on a golf ball. Punch, literally punch in a bag. Dig, dig it into the ground. Uh, explode, a massive explosion like a bomb going off. Shatter, the shattering of glass. And then hammer, literally the hammering of something. Now, did the images that come to your mind, that came to your mind, were they similar? I would imagine in many cases they were. But did the images that populated your mind were the exact same? Maybe in some cases, yes, but I'd argue in many cases, no. But as long as your image and my image mean the same thing, then likely when I use the word blast, punch, or shatter, for example, you're going to extract the same meaning as I intended. But for any of these, did you get a very different image in your mind, one that did not relate to the one that I'm seeing here? If you did, then the word I'm using, if my meaning is different than the meaning you interpret, it's not going to make sense to you. It won't make sense in the same way that using a word you're unfamiliar with altogether doesn't make sense. So this is why if I say a cue like, for example, explode off the ground for a jump to someone, and I say, what does that mean to you? And they say, well, you want me to drive off the ground. Do you hear what they did there? I used the word explode off the ground. They traded it in for drive off the ground. It's not better or worse, but it's what's better or worse for them. And if they trade that word in, listen actively and take that on board. Say, absolutely, I want you to drive off the ground. And the more you listen, the more you'll hear their narrative, hear their words, hear their familiar, and then you can use that, mirror it, echo it back in your coaching language, whether in an external cue or an analogy. So ultimately, 
We want language that is familiar, but we also need to be able to get to the verbs and the analogies that are accurate. They actually mean to us what they mean to the client or the, or the athlete. So accurate language captures the correct concepts in words that are interpreted as intended. This again is limited by familiarity as we talked about. So ultimately then, three really important things before we get to the application. You have to listen. Now I know we know this, but in listening is gonna be the gems that you need to coach someone better. So by involving the client or the athlete and asking questions, you get direct access to their language locker. Recycle, that means mirror your client's language where appropriate, when coaching on and off the training floor. This is not only good for connecting when teaching movement, but connecting in general. And notably, use those analogies. Compare new concepts to ones your client or athlete is already familiar with. Explode off like a jet taking off, right? Or explode off the ground like a cheetah is two steps behind you. Or explode off like a snake is about to snap the ankle. There's infinite possibilities, especially once you know the anatomy of the analogy. So with that then, let's zoom into analogies and start to talk about the anatomy of them. So here's one that I've been going through throughout this. Accelerate off the line like a jet taking off from an aircraft carrier. Now, if I had said accelerate off the line like a helicopter taking off, would that have made sense? As you reflect, it's probably quick to say, well, no, it doesn't make sense. A jet actually goes from low to high and moves in a forward direction exactly what I want in sprinting. Whereas a helicopter goes straight up. Well, I don't want my athlete popping straight up. So what does this mean? Well, just like an external cue by itself is not enough, it has to be the right external cue for the person and for the movement they're performing. Equally, it's not enough just to give an analogy. It has to be an analogy that captures, that hides within it, the technique you are trying to promote. So with this analogy, is the speed of movement the same? Most certainly is. They're both trying to go fast. Is the direction of movement the same? Absolutely. Low to high in a forward direction. Are the body positions similar? Sure, from head to heel, I'm trying to be straight. From the nose to the end of a plane, it is straight. And then finally, the force production, the energetics of the movement. Absolutely. High force, high violence, high propulsive activity, getting launched back into my seat on a jet taking off, pushing the ground back as I'm sprinting forward. So we can see there's a lot of biomechanical overlap. But the cool thing is you didn't have to detail out those four biomechanical notes. It's like a Trojan horse. They're just hidden inside of the analogy. The motor system translates it like the matrix, but the mind, all it sees is a simple image of a jet taking off. Keeping with that propulsive type of an idea, Explode off the ground like a rocket to the sky, or probably better yet, explode off the ground like a bottle rocket to the sky, even quicker. What do we think? Well, timing, both are fast. Direction, both are up. In terms of body position, trying to get straight in the air. Propulsive or force production, very, very high. Now let me be clear, not every single analogy needs to capture inside of it everything about the movement. But these two analogies I've shown happen to do that. Other analogies might be more nuanced. You might say something like, as you change direction, I want you to explode off the line like a rubber ball off the ground. In that case, you're only really talking about how quick someone moves off the ground, not necessarily giving any indication of body posture or what that lead leg should be doing. It's okay, as long as the analogy is formed correctly for the most dominant error you are trying to influence. So when we look at these analogies, number one, they need to be familiar. Number two, they need to be accurate, meaning you're not saying drive off the line like a helicopter taking off when you're teaching sprinting. It needs to be accurate to the error you are trying to overcome. And then when you look at that error, it might relate to body position, it might relate to speed, uh, it might relate to force production, it might relate to any element. It's up to you to make sure that you've captured those elements within the analogy. Now, when it comes to physically designing the analogy, I've thought long and hard about this. And from my perspective, there are three categories of analogies. I'm gonna be brief here, 
but there's great detail and opportunities to try to develop these yourself throughout my book. So scenario-based, what do I mean by that? These analogies use the same movement, but in a different scenario. So for acceleration, explode off the line like you're sprinting up a hill. So it's still a sprinting to sprinting comparison, but I'm encouraging them to sprint off the line like they're sprinting up a hill. Well, what does sprinting up a hill require you to do? It requires you to lift your legs. If you don't lift your legs, you're gonna run right into the mountain. Uh, it requires you to gradually rise. Obviously, in the case of a hill, that rise is forced upon you. But if you think about sprinting, if I say you gotta get up a hill, that's gonna make sure you don't just come out completely flat and literally trip over your feet like some athletes do and hit your face. You're actually gonna get out and up off the line, which is what we wanna see, more akin to that jet taking off. So you simply say, here's the movement I'm performing. Maybe it's a squat, maybe it's a sprint, Maybe it's some kind of accuracy task we hit in a baseball. And you say, what other movements are like this that they might be more familiar with? That if they thought about, could help them understand one part of the technique you're trying to promote. Constraint-based. Analogy uses the same movement within an imagined constraint. So now if I'm sprinting, I'm still here. I'm still in this environment. But I imagine something else is in this environment with me. So... Drive your knees forward as if to break a pane of glass. So in this case, I'm imagining that every single time my knee comes forward, there's a pane of glass. And I'm trying, to, I'm trying to shatter through it like a hammer through the glass. So I say break. Once I've given them that initial context, drive your knee forward as if to break a pane of glass. To peel away some of that internal language, I'm simply going to say break the glass or shatter the glass. So I'm still imagining that I'm moving in this environment but I've brought something else into this environment with me. Other examples of that might be, imagine that there's a wall to your left, to your right. Imagine that there's a book on top of your head. These are all examples of, I'm still moving in this context, but I imagine something else is here with me, which by its very nature would change how I move. And then finally, object-based analogies are where you, in their mind's eye, ask them to move like an object. So. Analogy metamorphosizes the body into some other material object. So explode off the line like a fighter jet taking off. In this case, we're asking them to imagine that their body is a fighter jet. The one I gave earlier, if it's change of direction, explode off the ground like a rubber ball off the ground. I'm asking them to metamorphosize, to move as if they have the same characteristics as that rubber ball. And what it allows us to do is take the materials that are non-human and map them onto our human form, allowing us to feel or get a sense of the reaction of those materials in our body, helping that movement come to life. So in review, scenario-based, drive off the line like you're sprinting up a hill. These are actual examples from the physical book. You know, we've brought a real model performing a real movement, and we've dropped them into that imaginary scenario that very much so is representative of what we can promote in the mind's eye. Constraint-based, I want you to explode or sprint forward, drive your knee as if to shatter, a pane of glass. And then finally, object-based, become that jet, drive off the line like a jet taking off. The beauty is we hide the biomechanics in a familiar object or a familiar scenario. So, summary, we've made it. You know, we've talked a lot, but we've said three major points. One focus cue, make it external or an analogy. And when we use that external analogy, you can use our 3D model of cueing and our analogy model to help you update, refresh, change and expand that language locker. And notably, we improve our language locker by increase our familiarity with the language locker of those we coach. So to bring that then to life, we go back to where we started, our coaching communication loop, the long loop. Describe it, demonstrate it, cue it, do it, debrief it. When we describe, that's the home for external and internal language. You're explaining what is going to happen. Internal language has a home. Demonstrate it is visual. Cue, external cues and analogies. We go from the what to the how. We give one phrase. We build learning one brick at a time. And during that debrief, we can use a mixture of external or internal language, but that's the key opportunity to question, to comment, to collaborate, to have a conversation, because only through conversation do we bring them into the learning fold. 
draws in their motivation, their connection, but also gives us critical opportunities for active listening so that we can understand their narrative, their familiar, to help them learn the unfamiliar. So to put some language to this, as we've said, number one, provide athletes with one cue at a time. Two, use internal cues to describe, only as needed, and external cues and analogies to coach. Ask yourself this critical question. Would you be happy with your athlete focusing on this during a game? Are you getting specificity of the mind alongside specificity of the body? Manipulate those three Ds, distance, direction, and description to unlock your client, your athlete, your patient's movement. And then finally, analogies, the superpower cue in my opinion, the infinite possibilities cue, conceals complexity with relatable visual information, helping using the familiar to teach the unfamiliar, leveraging the past to improve the present. And ultimately, remembering that the more we zoom into the micro, the harder it is to execute the macro. Let the mind establish the goal. Let the body achieve it. I want to thank you so much for your time. If you have any questions about this webinar, please email me at info at thelanguageofcoaching.com. I will continue to provide updates and insights around the book, around courses, and information in this space in general, at Nick Winkleman. That's both on Twitter as well as Instagram. And if you want to stay engaged in ongoing conversation around coaching and coaching language, please join the Language of Coaching group, as well as like the Language of Coaching page on Facebook. I wish you the absolute best. Thank you for your time. And remember, every step you develop, you take to improve your coaching ultimately improves your athletes. Best of luck.